Did everybody have a lovely lunch? Yeah? Say, say yes, Doug. Oh, you're very good. Yeah, clearly you had coffee as well. Let's kill the music. It's all, it's all about me. Music, music on, music on, music on. Okay. So change of pace in terms of introductions. I'm not going to be singing. You'll be glad to hear. No, no, you're really glad I'm not singing. Oh, I'm not going to do any dancing because I'm constructed entirely of knees and elbows and it will be dangerous. But in the interest of having such a lovely lunch, I'm going to give you a poetry recital. It's my favorite poem. It's a poem about food. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Poetry is hard. Bacon. <laughs> By my own fair hand. So who, who enjoyed Chrissy Wald's fireside chat last night? Did y'all go? Yeah? <laughs> Mind-blowing stuff. Awesome stuff. We're going to stay in the future for our next speaker. Astrid from Denmark, Copenhagen. Yeah? We're going to go through Peter's talk. We're going to go through that wormhole. We're going to put ourselves in the future. The reality is we are now beyond what Chris was talking about. We are there. So let's explore what that world actually looks like. What does it feel like? How does it work? What is this potential re new reality going to look like? I'm going to ask you to put your hands together and smash them repeatedly together to make a very loud noise and welcome Astrid to tell us what it's going to look like. So, welcome to my talk, which will be the scales of Anubis. Well, going forward, I would like to explain who I am. I'm the sales rep of Anubis. So don't go to me for the nuts and bolts. I'll tell you the value of our services here in the future. So imagine you didn't need to have your own customer database. Sounds nice. Well, imagine that you didn't need to ensure a consistent identity yourself. How about what if you only spent advertisement on people who actually wanted your product? or any product at all, and the moment they got the product, you weren't sending them any messages. Well, welcome to Anubis, your meta-analytics provider of choice. I will walk you through some of our base products and hope, of course, that you like our offerings and will choose us for our services. Well, what do we offer? Our base products. We have the in-market exchange evaluator, We've got the Corporation Evaluator, and of course, we've got access to the much coveted low-cost data set. So in our in-market uh, exchange value uh, evaluator, what we do is that we assess the probability of a value exchange for your products with very high accuracy. Further, we est estimate the probable exchange terms that would fit exactly your customer and your product and finally, we're able to create a profile for you that uh, looks at short-term, long-term value of exchanging with that customer. So, corporation. Well, we're able to ensure that the exchange terms and the corporated IDs are optimized continually. And we also evaluate the corporated IDs on a constant basis to ensure that the right fit for your company. And access to the Locust data set. Well, our pre-trained models are based on Locust and we use your incorporated IDs to adjust it, which we all know will give you a much higher, uh, you know, exchange value than just using your own incorporated model training. All right, is it time to break it down a little? I think so. So uh, just starting from the in-market picture, well, in the in-market window, an individual has a self-determined need, desire, what you want to call it for a product, and that emits an in-market signal to the companies that are allowed to, to do a bid for that, or the companies that fit, fit the requirements for the products that, they, that you want. So an example is that your coat is just getting worn and old, and Winter is coming, 
So uh, based on that, a signal is sent that you are actually really in dire need of a new code. But you could ask, how is that possible? Well, in the future, data is, emis is emitted constantly from both objects and individuals at the event stream level. So IoT assists us with this, and uh, an example could be an ID looking at a picture in their home, and they're looking at it for an extended period of time, and when they reach the 30-second marker, an event is emitted that now they have intentional gazing, and the ID have properties and the object properties are tied to that event. But who's doing that monitoring? Who's emitting that event beyond the objects? Well, here's where your personal artificial intelligence, also known as your pie, comes into the picture. Because all this event stream of data, uh, huge masses of data, the first processor of that is your pie. So the pie monitors all these events, but it also emits its own event. So it creates structuring of that base stream and uh, all that structuring ensures that there's relevance, high relevance in the events that are being emitted. So what determines the granularity? You could do you know, endless granularity in the monitoring you're doing, but all of this has some kind of processing spend tied to it. So we each have, has, have some kind of uh, currency for processing that determines our capabilities for our pie. And then the the uh, modeling capacity of your pie is also a determining factor. And that, of course, also costs something. But just like we heard about uh, Eval back, back in the day in 2020 in Super Week, we heard Eval talking about the parts and the known issue with the parts, which could be that how do we know they're valid? How do we know that somebody didn't fake a stream of data? Well, data doesn't live with you. It doesn't live in a part it lives in the ledger. So all events are recorded in a distributed ledger, and the data validity stems from the broadness of that DLT provider, and also, of course, the reliability and authority of that distributed ledger provider. All your IDs are linked to that DLT from birth, and these DLTs are called tribes. All right, so what's a tribe, you ask? Well, tribes are ways of interfacing with the com commercial world and governments. So they allow for, value, allow for value exchange for different strata of data at different exchange terms. So taking the specific well-known tribe of SLGia, they cater to exchange across all perceivable uh, strata. So both the personal, the medical, the social, the consumer, the user behaviors, all of it are accessible for value exchange. And the terms that they cater to are next to zero gold from the customer or the ID. And then processing currency and company currency and also specific types of licensing, use license instead of ownership could be ways that you would get a favorable deal with this tribe in your company. All right, so you could also look at this and say, but do we really want to sell our biomedical information? Well, if you don't, you don't join this tribe. You join a different tribe. How about, you know, kids? Should they be a part of this? No. So until majority, kids are actually uh, born into the Hebe tribe, it is supplied by either nationals or supranationals, so, you know, groups of nations together. And bio and consumer data strata, you can't use it for value exchange, it's just not accessible to anybody. Social and personal data is, but it has to be ID to ID exchanges and they have to be permissioned. They can't be automated. Then once you reach majority, you can choose to affiliate yourself with a different tribe, which has a different flavor of privacy. There's the hermit tribe, for instance. It's the rich people who don't really require any kind of data exchange. They prefer to pay solely with gold currency. That's their choice. 
You can't necessarily join any tribe you would like, because there can be requirements. For a tribe to be able to offer the terms that they do, they also have to have some kind of granularity in the data that is recorded. So you might not have the processing capability to match the requirements of a specific tribe, but you can always try to apply. You might have something else they would like. You might have a very particular user pattern or history or location. Or there could be multiple factors that could determine your value to the tribe. Well, so let's zoom in on the value exchange. We all know the old timers who used to say, if you're not paying, you're the product. But that kind of misses the point, because all of it is currency. Data is currency. Social influence is currency. And you know, any kind of thing that can be estimated and quantified is a currency in this world. And so, for instance, having a weird pattern of use can be a currency. And products are not just products. Right now, we tend to think of them, or in the past, we used to think of them as very physical things. But they span both actual things, but also services. They can be, have properties of reuse, or they can be single use. So what's a single use product? Food. What's a reuse product? A chair. A book. A piece of music. What about the exchange terms? What does that consist of? Well, we have, you know, the traditional transfer of physical ownership. That's like one end of the scale, but it's not the determinant factor of what we can include in the exchange terms. We already know some of the aspects from the past in the Creative Commons licensing that try to assert different types of usage that can be distinguished. So some aspects, exclusivity. Are you the only one purchasing this token? Or is it something that multiple people get? Are you allowed to share it? Can you use it commercially? Can you alter it? All of these things form part of the exchange terms. But even also, the payments could be licensing or leasing, or somebody could be paying you to use their product, because you're a socially important person. And when you're sponsoring a person, an ID, they will, for instance, emit brand signals at specific points in time in interactions with other people that allow for that type of data communication. So let's zoom in on the base products again. We have the value exchange probability for your product and the probable exchange terms and the long-term, short-term value. And the people following this would probably ask, so where do we get the probability from? I could see that that was what you were thinking. <laughs> so, well, go back to the in-market window. For the in-market window, for the duration of that window, the companies that are auto-approved for that product category by said tribe that an ID belongs to, they get access to the relevant data strata for that window. So what could that be? That could be all kinds of weird stuff. Here we have some value exchange history with the items and their properties you know, features and lifespan, material color, and so on. We also have usage history. So we have, you know, frequency of use, the context of use, satisfaction. And the satisfaction is both from the stated and unstated sources. We have attention, mobilization, and so on. And all of this becomes part of what a company has access to for a specific duration. You don't get probability from this alone. You have to have some models that produce it based on this data. But where does that come from? Here we go back to the pre-trained models. So meta analytics providers like Anubis, they maintain access rights to specific tribes. And this allows them to train models on this big locus data set uh, with various purposes. So you could be looking at you know, all kinds of different factors like brand affiliation markers, or strength of your purchase desire, or product usage pattern, and all of this to create an estimate for what is the ID product fit for your particular situation. And then that can be enhanced by the cooperated IDs. And what are those? Well, before I get to that, 
I think it's time to also have a little focus on the data part of this, because right now, we're used to thinking of data as something that we have. We think of it as something that is and is in our belonging at the same time, but that is actually an amalgam of two things. And in the future, there's the ledger, and then there's access to the ledgers, and those two things are totally divorced. And what that means is that access can be totally local to a transaction, or temporal, or it can be in the in-market window, and it, all of it has quantifiable value. So, all data in the future will be a need to know. And that brings us to the corporated IDs. So, companies and IDs can actually go into a specific type of contract in which the company gets constant access for the duration of the contract to the ID uh, data. And why would they do this? Well, there could be many different use cases that would make this super valuable, but just the one I could take in here was, you know, there might be users that are very quick to try out new things, new features in your software as a service product, or who have a very high frequency of use, and so all the quirky, annoying things you put into your product, they suss them out, and they are stressed by them, so they bring pressure to your product. And those could be enormously valuable for your product development. But this is just one example. You could also have uh, you know, anomalies so that you know from the locust model that people who have this and this and this attribute, they have a higher significance when you train models to achieve a higher exchange rate, exchange term. So those people would be nice to have in your own catalog. Yeah. So, well, what about customers? You talk about corporated IDs, but they're just our customers, aren't they? Well, no. Customers is not something we really talk about in the same sense anymore, because a company is only legally required to keep specific facts that they should be able to tie back to someone. But they don't need to have the rich data that they tie to individuals right now. So, you wouldn't know who the people you sold stuff to were. You wouldn't know if they were old or young, female or male, all of those things. You just had the ledger saying you did a transaction and it correlated to this legal ID. And that's it. Well, what does it mean to have a need-to-know basis for your access? Well, it could be all kinds of contexts that could benefit both the user and ID and a company. So some of them could be, you know, the transactional, just the base transaction, the product development, advertisement, authentication, legal. All of these could be part of the context in which you require some data, but you don't require all the rest. And why bother keeping it when you've used it for the purpose you would like to use it for? And here are some of the specific sub-elements that could be needed for these specific contexts. Well, looking at this, it also begs the question, I'm talking about IDs, but what are IDs? Well, IDs are multiple for individuals. You're born with an ID, and it's a bio-ID. It's issued by your, again, national or supranational identity bank and it's accompanied by a base legal ID. And then you interface with governmental institutions with your bio ID, and you can create new IDs at a processing cost, and you can use them for multiple purposes. You can have a social ID, you can have a personal ID, you can have multiple personal IDs, and use them however you please, either predefined or custom set up. And then they would have different you know, lifespans. You got divorced, and so the personal uh, idea you used in correlation with a network of people, you're not going to continue using it. You're suppressing the access rights of the individuals that you were collated to through your spouse, and you begin a new social identity or personal identity. And that way, you could have codified identities, codified uh, identity switches, 
over time that others could have invented as a specific life factor. So you lose someone dear to you. You don't want to have notifications of their birthdays, or maybe you do. You don't want to have uh, you know, automated messages stemming. You, you want to have the things that are valuable to you. And those things could be predefined and put into an identity and your access rights to it. So how about what will we be able to do with all this? Well, I heard you know, yesterday evening a lot of people wondering, why, why would this be valuable for me as an individual? And I can think of many things, but just to take a few, um, we could have something like product satisfaction monitoring, right? So did I use it? Did I talk about it positively? <coughs> did I use it, but then I used a similar product you know, for that specific thing which it didn't do for me? You could also have need anticipation, you know, the time of year where I usually bake or cry. Uh, you could have deadline monitoring, which is simple, yes, but it does require to be efficient access to all the different you know, areas where deadlines exist. And recommendations. Mood gauge, you know, how often in a day am I really, really sarcastic, you know, or am I tensing my muscles all the time? Or am I giving backhanders? So something like that to give you an idea, how am I feeling? And what could that do for me? Well, it could do all kinds of things. I could do the corporation hygiene based on this satisfaction monitoring. So in my recent rating last month, it turned out that four of the companies that I'm cooperated with, I'm actually not happy with. So I'm going to flag it to them, and they can either up what they're offering me, or I will just you know, discontinue that contract. It's not something I have to dedicate a lot of thought to. It just happens. You could also do the need anticipation, which will emit in-market flags. And again, there you could have a flavor that you could choose. So some people would like it to you know, work at the subconscious level. You know, they would just like it to be, yeah, just give it to me. Like, I don't even have to think about it. Yeah, oh, yeah, I need that. I want it. Thank you. And others would never want to have a guess presented to them that they hadn't already had as a conscious choice. And so they would just, you know, have a higher threshold for when an uh, in-market flag is put out there. Deadline monitoring doesn't require any further. But for instance, the recommendations. So right now we do have recommendation engines, but they have such a small subset of all our interaction with those things. And in this event streaming world we live in now, you know, you're listening to music and then you're smiling because it gives you this happy memory. That could be in there. Or that you get up and you just dance a little because it's so great. That could be in there. All of these small things that we do that uh, determine some kind of relationship and preference for things could be part of this and create hyper-relevant recommendation for us. And then, of course, finally, it would be nice to know which pill to take today to have the right kind of mood that we're in for the purposes we have. So that was a little trip into the future. And uh, I would like to hear if you have any questions or comments. Well, first of all, how about a round of applause? Let's say thank you. Let's <laughs>